meeting to order. Um, any adjustments to the agenda? Look, it's so full. It has a smaller font than usual. <laughs> Actually, it's because it's a new The new program. template program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, so hearing no adjustments, we'll deem the agenda approved. Um, number three is comments from the chair. So we, we weren't able to gather a quorum last meeting. And it's okay. It happens sometimes, but... I think I mean, for the two with newborns, you're off the hook. Mm -hmm. But for everyone else, we really need to make an effort to be here. Um, you had a, an emergency, so I understand, and I know you were going to be out of town. So it, it really was beyond what most people, you know, it was an emergency. But I just wanted to use it as an excuse mm -hmm. to remind everyone that we really need to make an effort. Um, and if we can't meet on a certain day, then we can try to set up another meeting if needed. Um, of course, I'd like to avoid that because we'll just, it's hard to keep momentum if we only meet once a month. So it's, um, I don't blame anyone. I know everybody had extenuating circumstances. I just wanted to remind us all of the necessity of being here. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention to everyone is that uh, Kirby and I had lunch with Eric Gilbertson, who is the chair, I think, of the Historic Preservation Commission. Mm -hmm. Commission, right? Not committee. Yes, commission. Thanks, Barb. And he is a member of the Design Review Committee. And he's been a member of that for many years. And uh, he gave us a quick overview of the Historic Preservation <coughs> slash design review committee work that's been undertaken, <coughs> that has been submitted to us to review and that they're going to present to us in June. So I really encourage everyone to make it to that meeting. I think we're looking at um, June 10th. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to set the date. Number okay. six. We'll oh, number six. Okay, so we'll set the date. Leslie, is that going to be our next meeting then? Or because we won't have one on Memorial Day, or do we want to reset the Memorial Day meeting? Well, we can talk about that. Um, let's do that under item nine. Since we didn't meet last time, it might be a good idea to do that, but let's just hold on to that for now. And but Good question, Barb. Um, okay, any other old business, for lack of a better word? Okay, so general number item four, general business, comments from the public about something not on the agenda. There are new members of the public present, so we'll move on to item five, which is for Mike to provide us an update on consultant selection for the Montpelier Downtown Master Plan. Okay, RFP. So we did the RFP. We did the request for for proposals. We got five <coughs> applicants, and we had a committee that included two transport. Well, actually, three transportation folks. Two from the transportation infrastructure. One from the complete streets, which was Gary um, Holloway. Then we had two kind of open space. Elizabeth Courtney and. Ricarda Erickson from the River Conservancy. And then we had two economic folks, the MDC director and Dan from Montpelier Alive. So they were the review committee for the five applications. Um, went through, narrowed to a short list, and um, had interviews and uh, hired um, SE Group, who did work with St. Albans, and a couple other communities, uh, for a lot of work in Burlington on their Great Streets project. So um, they're, we're really happy to have them on board. Um, I've known members of the team for a long time, but I haven't actually worked with any of them directly on a project, so it'll be good. So uh, the only comment that had been made on um, about their proposal was um, they there was a feeling that they hadn't didn't have enough um, 
public input. They actually had a lot that was more on the technology side. They're going to have websites and interactive, a lot of you know, a lot of the the whiz bang things that John would love. But um, some of them wanted the we all love them, a couple of more technic uh, of you know more meet the people where they are type things. So SE Group is giving us a, a revised public input uh, plan that will involve more direct face-to-face, -face. Um, so going to farmer's markets, going to parades, and things. <coughs> rather than try to get people to come to you, they're going to have more events where they go out to where yeah. people are. So he's coordinating, um, Mark Kane, whose SE group is coordinating with Dan at Montpelier Live to kind of coordinate when the big events are with when they can come out and try to work with the public, try to get their input on some of the ideas for uh, making state in Maine, um, you know, kind of coming up with that downtown master plan of what we want to try to see. I know the council is excited and on board, um, and they have a number of ideas. They know these are kind of expensive endeavors, but they're kind of looking at, you know, they really want to see if we could kind of do one of those downtown large downtown projects that have been done in Barrie and Winooski and they really want to get in and see if we could kind of make 21st century streets out of our downtown. You know, we've got to replace the street trees anyways with the emerald ash borer. We have to do more stormwater treatment. So this is a, a great opportunity for us to get in and kind of transform, transform our streets and doesn't St. Albans have um, rain gardens or, or some sort of fancy storm water treatment system? Yeah, they have. They, yeah, they have some, and the uh, the same group that helped do some of those are going to help here. I guess we'll learn a lot from what St. Albans learned as the first one. Um, the same group, the Watershed Consulting Group, also did our demonstration project that's being built this summer on Taylor Street. So Taylor Street's actually going to have a lot of those rain gardens and tree boxes, uh, tree cells, silva cells, um, which are going to have catchments underneath. So as stormwater goes in, they go through the, tr the mm -hmm. through the cell, and then there's a, a catchment mm -hmm. pipes on the bottom to bring the water to the treatments. yeah. So the treatment is through the mm -hmm. those tree beds. So it's it's a neat system. Um, a lot of it we're doing a demonstration project on Taylor Street. So Public Works, the Tree Board, and other departments get a chance to kind of see how they work, how easy is, is it for maintaining them, um, all of those types of things. And so hopefully what we learn there we can transfer to State and Maine when we redo those streets. Can you give us a little bit more context about how you're envisioning this fitting within the city plan development process? So this is really um, a nuts and bolts plan for um, this the publicly owned parcel. So they will look at the parking lots as well because a lot of this involves trade-offs. Um, the current plan for State and Maine uh, or for Barry, the Barry Street intersection, they did the scoping study. The plan there is to take some on-street parking off of Main Street as well as Barry Street. So there's a net loss of 30 or 40 parking spaces, so we have to balance that. So we really have to look at all the pieces um, of our parking networks to kind of decide, you know, if, if there's a desire to have more park space and we have to remove parking, then that's, you know, we're really, we'll need to have more answers for parking. And maybe that comes with the parking garage, maybe that comes in another parking somewhere else. Um, but that's kind of it's kind of going to be looking at all of the the downtown, all the publicly used pieces in the downtown. That's going to obviously plug into the city plan, but the city plan is really looking um, kind of big picture, and it would probably mention that one of the as we talk about how to implement our city plan, one of the things is going to be implementing the downtown master plan because that'll be a big, that's a big lift. But if people want to have bike lanes in the downtown, at some point there's just no getting around the fact that you're going to have to shut down the street and, you know, bang out some curbs and 
start moving things around if you want if you want to have uh, new street trees and new drainage systems and you know we'll have to make some big decisions and I think what we'd end up with is in our city plan a discussion of how are we going to be you know in the natural resources we might be talking about stormwater and the importance of treating stormwater and then you know one thing is going to be how do we treat stormwater on our in the downtown it's it's more challenging than in you know once you get out of downtown you can treat a lot of stuff on site and it becomes more challenging when you get to a place that's a hundred percent impervious but you can do it with technology the parking garage will have will treat all of its storm water on site before it discharges in fact a bunch of it will discharge into the, the sewer system so that way it gets treated at the plant as well um, but treating the storm water that's on our streets is going to be an important piece and that's just one example of all the things that are going to come up in our downtown mm -hmm. um, so there may be a number of goals that will come up in the city plan broadly that we'll be implementing in the downtown master plan when it gets constructed so Mike it, it's called a master plan but really it's state and Maine. it's the two streets really Right. Yes. Um, so we have a master plan, had a master plan for the Capitol complex, which right. is from Taylor Street and Governor Davis over to Bailey. So that box. Not ours. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the theirs. Capitals. We've done a master plan and are building out Taylor Street, so we'll have that street done. Um, and then the idea was originally let's do State Street to Maine, so that way we're just kind of build off of this. Um, what would the, the, the street lamps look like because the light poles that light the streets don't actually work very well. They're very old and need to be replaced. Um, so we have a number of things that just need to be replaced on there including the Rialto Bridge and we figured this would be a time to just shut down that section of the street, fix that up and then when, when the questions came up about what to do about Confluence Park and the Moat property where Eminem Beverage was then we had to expand this into a broader discussion and then Main Street out to school, school across to Elm and down so obviously Langdon Street would be in. It includes Langdon Street and that, that square, oh okay. Yeah so there is kind of a, a, a piece, obviously our, our emphasis is on State and Maine and Barrie, Barrie to Hubbard actually. We wanted to get past, we didn't want to stop at the rec facility because you really have to discuss how let's say somebody coming down the hill in Barry coming into town how do they transition to the bike lane if you're on Barry Street you know we really want to yeah. look back as far as Hubbard Street to see maybe they, maybe it's all the way back to Hubbard Street that we don't have on street parking maybe it comes off later but we'll look at a slightly larger picture so we can kind of fit all the pieces in I have one other question. Is the is the actual proposal public knowledge? I mean, can we see their proposal? Yep. In terms of what they're going to be doing? Yep. Yeah, that's uh I'm trying to think of where's the should easiest add it way to, our to get website. it. We should. <laughs> <laughs> It'd just be good to know in terms of what yeah, they're including, I'll what they're not, so we don't ask questions that they're not covering. Yeah, I'll try to so send out a copy of the where did the guiding principles come from that the that was in, that were included in the RFP? Like for instance, like the bike lanes, like where did the idea come from? For for like bike lanes to be part of this master plan. Like the like the things that are actually the, that are to be addressed. So the there's been a Montpelier in motion plan and then there was a complete streets plan that came out as well which talked about a lot of how to get bikes and pedestrians into the downtown and then it was left off that the downtown is so complex we can't just come up with a set of general rules we really have to plan for specifically where they're going to end up being state and maine was the f was kind of the piece that needed to be answered for a number of projects we have tiff the projects for Saban's pasture and these other projects 
can't get Act 250 approval until there's a fix for Barry and Main intersection. So we kind of had this thing on our list of things to find an answer for. We knew we had the bike lane coming through, so we still had the question of how do, how do bikes get from Main Street to the rec center? We've got a bike path built that side, and a bike path built that side, but nothing in the middle. So we had a number of these questions, so the Public Works Department did the scoping study for the Berry and Main intersection, which included most of the downtown. So that project and proposal is going to be the foundation that these other folks will work off of. Um, and that one was looking at, okay, well, where are we going to put the bikes? You know, because whether you have bikes or don't have bikes and where you put them makes, because the question was, do we put a roundabout or do we put a street light at Barry and Main? And then same question for, or for Bain, Main and Barry. And then state in Maine, same question. And then school in Maine, same question. Do we have a roundabout? Do we have a light? And it was found that you can actually make roundabouts work at any of them. But don't they have to all be roundabouts though? There was a question of them all being roundabouts, and then there was, and it was, it came out that you could do a hybrid if, if um, state in Maine were a light, you could still make it work. I don't know what the final decision is yet for the council. I don't know if that's coming up. I'm just looking at their board up there. I don't see it on that one. So I don't know if they have voted yet on which is their preferred alternative that they're going to have the consultant finalize. Um, I think the consultant is recommending a hybrid, but the recommendation is just that. It's a recommendation, and council can decide, and there are councilors who have said that they would prefer a roundabout alternative. So we kind of have to see where that goes, um, but that's, that's kind of where some of those foundational pieces came from was, was the complete streets plan. We have to plan for bikes, pedestrians, and motorists. Um, but the question starts to come in, in limited, limited real estate, um, do we need to remove on-street parking? If we do, where do those cars go? You know, what is the impact economically? Um, you know, are we better having the bikes share the road in a share road situation? Which, which would be perfectly fine. You could simply just go through, as we do now on State Street, it's share road. If you want to ride your bike, you ride with the traffic, and that's a perfectly fine alternative. Um, but if we wanted to encourage more biking and having less conflicts, and we want to encourage younger and older people to be able to feel safe riding a bike, then you sometimes want to have a separated bike lane, which means removing on-street parking and so that's that's where they put that in but hopefully those decisions will be made before SE group starts to so it sounds like we need it. someone to synthesize these other reports a lot of it is synthesizing and a lot of it is you know it's kind of taking what was plans out here you're starting to get closer up because while that was a plan that talked about a lot of the very important pieces where are the cars where's the parking where are the bike lanes where are the sidewalks it didn't get into where are the street trees? Do we want street trees? Um, do we want benches? Where do we want benches? Uh, street lights. How often do we want street lights? Do you want, you know, you're starting to get into much finer detail if we've got a bump out for a crosswalk that shortens the signal. You know, something I learned at a meeting a few weeks ago. So how long a crosswalk light turns everything red depends on how far the crosswalk is. And so by putting bump outs, you can shorten that time, which helps traffic flow better. By but the way, if you're bump too short at the intersection <laughs> of Memorial Drive and You have to Hill run. Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does look short. But you do, um, you then have to start to decide where you're going to put your street lights because you, you know, I think we've all been in communities where you're driving along and all of a sudden there's somebody in a crosswalk and you didn't even see them because there's not a light pole there so you can see them if the if it's if the sun is down so i think there are just a lot of pieces that once you get <coughs> past where we are right now which is we've got a core scale we know where the 
lanes are, we know the turn lanes are, we know whether this is a roundabout or a street light, got all those answered. Now we need to talk about the details. Where do we put our crosswalks? Where do we put our, our, our curbs? How wide? Let's make some final arguments as to whether we want four foot separated bike lanes or five foot separated bike lanes and start to make these very detailed questions because if everybody agrees, the next step would then be to basically bring it into the hands of the civil engineers and start to go through and say, okay, if we were going to build this thing out, let's start looking at conflicts. Let's start looking at what works, you know, is there, you know, and, and they have Stantec on board who is our, one of our primary engineers we work with. And so a lot of these questions will hopefully be addressed early. Um, their SE group kind of was the choice because they had worked on so many projects that had gone from conceptual to built. And we wanted somebody who is looking ahead. Yeah. So we're talking here, they're already looking ahead to know so Aaron, what's next. Since you just joined us, we're on item five. Yeah. And the quick update is that the consultant that's been selected is the SE group and Mark Kane is the principal on that. Yep. Who you should yeah. know yeah. from your time working with him. Um, and they did some work in St. Albans and Burlington uh, to develop downtowns in a more cohesive approach. Um, and so this would be really state and main. And what I'm understanding is they have Stantec on board, which is what you're just getting at. Mm -hmm. They're going to be looking at the complete streets report, report the uh, Montpelier in motion report, and then taking them a little bit further and developing more detail. Um, I'm still not entirely clear on how we will be interacting with Mark and his group. It it seems like maybe we're delegating an aspect of the city plan a little bit here, but may, but we also would want an opportunity to weigh in. And so I am. Um, it sounds like that hasn't all been fully developed yet, which is fine, but. Maybe we could continue talking as, as he presents ideas and we yep. nail down Yeah, we can approach. certainly keep um, everybody in the loop on what the, the where, where they're at and what are the pieces that are going on. And if you want them or him to present, you know, as they wrap up pieces, we can have them try to go and I build like that in. I would like us to be involved. I mean, I just don't want to get, you know, a final product at the end and I say, oh, no, we, we, we. <laughs> You know, I, I just, I don't, I don't know that that would happen, but there is a risk that that will happen if we don't integrate um, feedback. And yes, we can individually, as members of the public, provide feedback. But I think that our group is you know, greater than the sum of its parts here. I mean, we are a, a committee; have been working together, and mm -hmm. we have kind of a sense of some of the issues where the public might feel strongly and it would be great to be able to provide some input along the way. How do others feel about that? Any thoughts on process you want to provide now before we get too far down the road? <laughs> I had a question about what you said before, Mike, but so are they going to be waiting on decisions from council before they get started? Uh, yes, <coughs> but D and K is supposed to have the Barry Main scoping study done by the end of this month. So that's another piece that they need to be. Yeah, that's one. Of, that's one. Of, but they can start doing pieces, other pieces. So we're working on their contract right now. But there are a lot of integrating a lot of plans that are out there. So there's not just those plans. We have the EDSP. We've got um, the. Um, Net Zero Vermont proposed um, competition and the results, all those results, um, which they are aware of. Um, so we've got a number of different pieces that, that uh, and plans that are that are out there that they can start reviewing and assembling and pulling things together, even if they don't have the final Barry Main scoping study yet. And what's their timeline for the project? Uh, they're planning to start in June and be done by March. Okay. Just looking at their website.
but most of the heavy lifting will be done by December, January. You know, most of that ending stuff is presentations to council and. So can you give us sort of just the skeleton of their their plan, you know, for developing their ideas and in. I mean, because you said they're planning to go to the farmer's market, so I'm assuming they're going to be doing that in the summer. Yes. For example. So, <sighs> I, I mean, I guess, yeah, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot because you don't have their actual proposal in front yeah, of you. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but, yeah. So they, they kind of broke into three pieces, one of which was um, kind of compiling. Well, the first one is to compile all of the information and to start working with stakeholders on kind of the that development of issues, problems, you know, understanding all of the plans that are out there, where the conflicts may exist, bringing all that together. And then the second, then there's a second piece, which is, I guess they called refining the vision, where they're going to be trying to go and then work with the public to go through and said, this is what we found in doing all of our homework. And then after they get, that's where the farmers markets and these um, the things in the windows where people can punch stuff in and text things in and their thoughts and put stuff online. Um, so they would have a lot of these opportunities for people to provide input in this second window. And then the third window is this is kind of what, this is what we've heard, this is where we're starting to put stuff together and then start looking for reactions from people on alternatives. You know, here's here are a couple of alternatives. There, it won't be as. That seems like a good time for us to get involved. Mm -hmm. the, th the third. Oh, you, yeah, you definitely, definitely should be in should. on the third. But uh, yeah, the second or the third would be, okay. you know, because they're going to need to have your input before. But okay. you'll definitely want to be watching what's okay. going on in the third piece. Um, but I think that's going to be. I think that that's kind of how they. You know, if I'm clumsily lumping them together. Seems like we'll be farther along in the um, city plan process and maybe be a little more informed than we are now, too. So yeah. maybe a little bit more prepared to have that conversation then. Thank you for all the detail. Any other thoughts or questions about that? Right, so I'll, I'll send out a copy of their proposal. Thank it you. doesn't have, we're still waiting on their revised public input proposal, so it'll just be what they submitted. And are the complete streets report or the Montpelier in motion report, are those on the website somewhere? I would think they would be. Okay. They're on the city's website, I don't know if they're on the yeah, that's what I meant, the city's website, but maybe they're under the Transportation? Yeah, sure. Transportation yeah. Infrastructure okay. Committee, yeah. With the new format, it's going to be a lot easier to find things, isn't it, Mike? I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the web guy, but I hope so. <laughs> right. Okay. That's item five. So item six update on historic preservation commission's efforts to revise design review provisions in the zoning bylaws so <coughs> as background for those of you who didn't get to go through this with all of us when we were working on all of the zoning changes um there we kind of stumbled when we reached the design review section and um, we heard a lot of feedback that the current design review process was not working particularly well. And we came to the conclusion as a committee, or at least I came to this conclusion, I think the group agreed, but that it seemed to be um, an issue of lack of clarity in what the standards were and how they were being applied was being perceived as arbitrary. So we sought to clarify the standards and reduce the opportunity for discretion within those standards and we received um, a lot of pushback from the design review 
Well, it was really more of the historic, historic preservation, preservation group, which had been disbanded, or not disbanded, but inactive inactive for quite a while. And, and so individual <coughs> members of the group came to our meetings and said, hold on, first of all, no, don't adopt these standards because they're not aligned with the Secretary of Interior standards, and we, we think those are the gold standard that we should be applying. Um, in addition, people who seek federal tax credits. And I think there's some grants available grants. for buildings that are located in, the, in places where the standards are applied. Yeah, they have to meet the Secretary of Interior standards, so having them right. apply to, to be eligible for the grant, you have to meet the standards. So, so you the argument is why not just require it. There's actually a failure of logic there to think about it. Yeah. Like but that was there. Requiring right. everyone to do it just because it's a grant requirement. It's not right. It's so not the, so it's I not mean, as connected as, it, it doesn't, you only need it for, you can only el eligible for grants if you have a commercial property. So it really, you know, and then applying it to all the residential properties is, anyway, so um, then we put it back on them and said, okay, if you don't like our language, give us what you think we should work with. And they said, okay, well, we need to get a grant to do that. So that effort was undertaken, and they are now reporting back on that. That's as far, that's my understanding of where we are, right, Kirby, Mike? Yeah, and we had some public input, and the public didn't exactly come out in favor of it either. We had a room. A room full of people who didn't want us expanding the grow, uh, expanding the historic preservation and well, there was a couple issues that were getting conflated. As far as the actual design review standards that are in the zoning, that's the, I've summarized that. The other issue that Mike is talking about is that um, in conjunction with changing the standards, we were thinking about changing. The, the, the area, the design review uh, overlay district. And the historic federal, the hi federal historic register lines didn't align with the city's historic uh, overlay district. I don't know a better way to describe yeah. it. The so design review isn't the same as the historic district. So we felt like it was a no brainer to align those two. The public didn't agree. <laughs> so, um, what? On what basis? It does seem like a no brainer. They didn't like it. Well, um, it means more regulation on the people who weren't previously in the, in the design review district and now would be. Um, and given the perception of arbitrarily applied standards by the design review committee, the public uh, that were soon to be regulated were very upset about this concept. So um, the city council heard anecdote after anecdote about um, unfortunate processes before the design review committee, which may or may not, I mean, they were all one-sided. <coughs> and the design review committee came up, and some of them gave, not, not well, just really Eric spoke, Eric Gilbertson. And, um, Eric has incredible expertise. He used to be the state historic preservation officer for many years. Um, but with great expertise often comes people getting in the weeds really fast. And so we'd hear resident after resident complaining about the process. And then he'd get up there and talk about how the trim needs to look a certain way. And it just wasn't a very compelling counter argument. So I think you know city council uh, agreed with our recommendation to just wait. I don't remember exactly procedurally how it all played out, but ultimately it came back to us to just wait and get this input on the standards from the Historic Preservation Commission with input from the Design Review Committee. They were tasked with together coming up with standards that they thought were acceptable and that would be applied because the Design Review Committee is the committee that actually applies the standards. So, and then what they what they do is they provide a recommendation that goes to the DRB. So that goes to the DRB or the City Council. To the DRB, who oh, then okay. issues the decision about right. They approve the, the design review district or the design review regulations. Oh, so the the projects that are being 
oh. presented, the development projects or... Uh, oh, oh, right. They would use But the, the actual district does need to be approved okay. by city council. Okay. You're right. Yeah. And so, but, we, so we have standards that, that we'll hear about from, um, from Eric later on, but the boundary decisions, they don't really have a suggestion for that, just as a heads up. Like, that's still an unsettled question that it seems like we're going to have to... Continue. Well, it's actually, the they oh. pushed it through um, after everything quieted down. Didn't the design? Didn't the um, historic preservation, um, the historic district boundaries change? I'm fairly certain. That Hist they did. Historic yes. did, yes, but not design review. Okay. So this will be looking at the design review. The Is the historic so district yeah. bigger than the design that. review okay. district? They're actually just different kind areas. Of different areas. Okay. They partially <laughs> overlap. Um, if you happen to be into design review and are not part of the historic district, then there are there are different standards that apply to you. And we we um, we wanted to have kind of the same set of mm -hmm. standards, but then certain aspects of them wouldn't apply. Mm -hmm. But I I don't know exactly how the historic preservation commission landed on that, which you know, we we will be hearing about. Yeah, we had a the, one of the questions that we put to them to decide was. And I'll need to go and read carefully see where they came out on it. Was did they want design review standards? Did they want historic preservation standards, or did they want a mixture of both? Because you can have design standards that apply to Route 302, nothing historic out there, and you could have you know some historic rules that are very specific about historic structures, and you know you can't do X, Y, and Z to historic structures, and if you're a non-contributing structure, then you, whatever you do can't have a negative impact on the historic structures, so it's really kind of a much lesser, but then there's these mixes of the two, and what we have now in, you know, in, in the old rules that are still in effect are, is kind of a mixture of both. It never really makes itself one or the other. It's kind of, you know, a little bit of these scenic and design requirements and then one that says and you can't have a negative impact on the historic character so part of this when you start talking about the boundary is if you're only doing historic preservation it doesn't make sense not to be outside the historic district places like national life the areas past the high school so the the Vermont Electric or the Green Mountain Power and those buildings are all in the design control district, even though they're, none of them are, are, hist are historical. Um, and how did, how was the design review boundary originally determined? Do you know? I don't have the history Nobody of that knows. one. Nobody knows. <laughs> that that came out in that the meeting. Don't you remember that? Yeah, but yeah. I thought it was we Everyone was like, well, shouldn't we look into boundary. how it got to be this way? And, yeah. you know, we just don't have that and information. Why they why they didn't um, coincide, I certainly understand, but it does seem like the some aspects of the design review district are a bit bizarre. Do you mind if I close the window? Sorry. Oh, no, right. there's, there's a fine. couple of them. Oh, there's a, okay. Well, I'm just going to close this one. <coughs> so for people who got the three, um, that is the current version of what we have in effect. The big heavy one is the draft of what they're proposing. And then Eric Gilberton sent you guys a memo with his right. kind of a two and a half page memo of his input. And you just emailed these out today. Right? And I just so emailed the, them out today. So, so the, yeah, so the thought wasn't that we would review these tonight, but that if I got them to you tonight, then you would have them for the, the next meeting, which um, they were going to look to try to come on June 10th or June 24th, depending on They're looking how it for works their out. critical mass. Yeah, so they sent out a feeler as to which day worked best for them, and either the 10th or the 24th would work for them. So, we're, yeah, we're going to wait and hear back. Mer Meredith has been uh, trying to herd those cats and Try to get as many people from both the Historic Preservation Commission and Design Review Committee to attend as possible because I think a, a committee, and I would encourage all of you to come. I, I don't know what date it will be yet, the 10th or the 24th, so we'll let you know as soon as possible, but the more people that can be part of that discussion, I think the more productive it will be. 
So is it going to be part of our meeting, or it's mm -hmm. going to be Those okay? Are our so current, current things. You're just saying yeah. To our meeting. Okay. They're coming to us. Yeah. Okay. okay. I wasn't sure the way you said encourage you to come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure we all come yeah. here. <laughs> um, just once June hits, hopefully the weather will be nicer. It's harder and harder to get here, but we got to, yeah. So anyway, um, so the set possible joint meeting, I think that I, did I add that before Meredith sent out the email? Uh, uh, actually, Audra, Audra, Audra kind of after we were, talking about it we were like well let's let's at least put it on there as a reminder that we we could set the possible joint meeting mm -hmm. so that way it's we have to notice that any earlier than we would normally for our meetings no and uh, certainly not for you guys because your meetings are is is that night mm -hmm. if they're going to have a quorum of people there then there's some special rules they might have to we might have to Okay. Word the agenda in such a way that it says that there's a possibility of a quorum of historic preservationists or design review folks that might be here. So what's the process and then they're presenting it to us and then they're going to go back and change things based on comments or what's the... My understanding is that they want to go and actually take this first to the planning commission and then second to to and I don't know if they're asking you us to do the the public outreach and then go to go to council they're not going to adopt these rules in their entirety what they need to do is to get enough public input that they know these are going to be acceptable because what they want to do after this is to do design guidelines because these kind of need guide a guideline design book which Just we had people a little people bit who were here as to what it means to what it would like re rehab or restore or replace it's a very graphic <coughs> <laughs> um, the set of guidelines that just go through and say yes we want this no we don't want this um, these types of windows are good these are not this is you know we, when we talk about maintaining the fenestration this is what we mean we want to see this not this um, Shelburne has a good set of rules and, and Brandy when she was working with us on the zoning gave us ones from around the country they're just very you know 100 plus pages of, of kind of this and that <coughs> type scenarios but we can't spend the money making that type of spending that much if somebody comes in later on and says yeah but we're not going to do that so what they want to do is kind of run this through but we can't really adopt it because we wouldn't have the guidelines but there's no sense making the guidelines till we have a good sense that this is where the public would like us to go so i think that's the, the catch 22 that they are in is that they want to try to kind of get some feelers on this, see what the public thinks, see what the planning commission thinks, see what the council thinks, and then move forward with the guidelines. So we would provide them input. Potentially we could ask for updates, or we could just take it and make the updates. And then at some point we recommend to council <coughs> that they give the green light to develop guidelines using these rules. That's what I'm I think so. And then out. and then it would all come back for us to have a full adoption of the new right. standards plus the guidebooks that go along with it. Okay. So and maybe the uh, just cuz these seem fairly detailed to me but the design guidelines will be more about the buildings or can you tell me a little bit more about what the I think like we'll get more when they give their their presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe they a should. For after I've actually read this. Yeah, because there is. I think they they do have quite a lot of specific in in here. Because um, I think there is the what they have under you know general design standards, and then they have some specific design standards, and then there's. The guidelines that would go along with each of these. There's still a lot of subjective language in here. Like, it's 
talks a lot about how an addition shall not overwhelm the primary facade. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> you know, so I think this, this guidance would be like an interpretation, I hope. Yeah, that's that's of, what of you, you need to have the guide oh, okay. book that would explain Here, what that means. Windows, <laughs> windows in the facade shall create a rhythm. <laughs> like... Most properties change Seems like over some time. interpretation is in order. You don't yep. know what changes. <laughs> yeah, here's another one. Most properties change over time. Those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's you. a that's, lot of aspects. That's helpful to you. understand kind of what the... Yeah. Um, and just out of curiosity, I mean, there's no requirement that we have to have a design review district, right? Correct. Or, okay. Don't we have to have some historic? If we want to have a CLG, then right. we need to have, which is a certified local government, um, for historic preservation purposes, then we need to have design standards. But not a design review district. You have to have HP design standard, or? Uh, depending on which, which argument you're having with which person is historic preservation. Oh. So. Um, it's you're supposed to have standards that would protect uh, that would preserve or protect the historical integrity of the district so that would be the, the standards so you could have them apply citywide and we could get rid of a district I think the point is just that we need regulation some kind of design review regulations yeah. for a lot of different reasons that yeah. our TIF district and our designated downtown as well need some kind of design review it's possible, as I understand it, to have two sets of regulations. We could have a stricter central downtown area and then the less strict outer area, which, because some some folks who haven't liked it in the past would be in the kind of outer part of the historic district. So I think that, yeah, that was something we had discussed and we're maybe moving towards because we have a designated downtown area that's the commercial core and then the, most of the complaints were coming from sort of single family homeowners replacing windows or um, well, siding or, and we didn't hear much from the commercial owners so there was this thought that there could be a higher standard for um, the downtown commercial core designated downtown it's already a boundary and then different, different standards those are the ones that <coughs> can have apply for the Right. right, and the, the rationale being that there are actually public funds available to um, offset the added costs. Yeah, yeah, offset the added costs where that, that it's not an option for the residential properties. You have to see what the DRB thinks of that, because it would be a little harder for them to have two sets of standards to apply. Oh. If it's two different, if, if it's two separate districts, then you're just applying one set to one district and one set to the other district. So it doesn't make any more work for the DRB. The issue starts to come up if if it were citywide. DR the design review committee, the DRC currently reviews all projects in the design review district. If we went citywide, that would simply exponentially increase their workload, and everybody would have to go to DRC. So that would be just a consideration unless there was a separate process for them as well. Yeah, I think I meant DRC earlier when I said that. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, I mean, I thought I would, they may not like having two sets of standards to have to keep track of. I don't know. Yeah. But I think a lot of these are good questions to ask them, because they're going to come here with their PowerPoint and present to you guys. Um, I think they're they're the ones to ask a lot of questions. I haven't met with them about these. I was given a draft over the winter that I reviewed and gave some comments on, and my brain didn't retain enough of it for me to thoughtfully <laughs> give you guys some input. So they've made some revisions to that draft. So I, d I haven't seen the final version <laughs> until till now. And Barb, you're a historic. You're you have a historic architect specialty right well i wouldn't necessarily say a specialty <clears throat> sorry i came back with a bad cough but um certainly have, have been involved with buildings in the city and other places that had historic aspects too so <clears throat> what i'm getting at is you might have to be our translator okay mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually i think 
um, at one point, um, Mike had given out copies, I think, of the, the one that Brandy did before. Yeah. Um, no, really. um, Shelburne. Shelburne, right. <clears throat> and in terms of looking at guidelines, that's really helpful because it actually has drawings and indications of what they're. Um, so it would be easier to see how those two pieces fit together. Mike, so, do you think you could add that to the Google Drive, just so people can take a look at it if they want? Maybe these, the historic, doc, the historic preservation documents that the committee commission sent to us, and then the Shelburne standards. So interested planning commissioners can review. If there's going to be a document created, and I'm not necessarily asking for more work, but I think the ideal thing would be to have a side-by-side -side of what currently exists and what they're proposing here. Mm -hmm. um, that, would just, that would just be ideal. If we could, you guess know what I mean by side-by-side, -side, where there's the two columns, where it's like, this is what it has now, and this is what's either being added or removed over here. Well, I think there's just so much being added. The currently, a lot being added. currently exists is basically what was there before, mm -hmm. right? They, we just took what was in the zoning document previously. Yeah. Yes. And so it's... Uh, Doesn't it just like follow the Secretary of the Interior standards? No, we wanted to do that. They said, we, we said follow we them except mix. when it comes to windows and, and the Historic Preservation Commission didn't like that. And anyway. Yeah. So this is yeah, what the current zoning has made printed out for us, mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty bare bones. Yeah, most of them for point D is most most of most applications are going through point D on that yeah. front page, mm -hmm. which is just preservation and reconstruction of the appropriate historic style if the proposed project is in the historic district or involves a historic structure. That should be shallow that the. Committee shall evaluate design review plans based on the following considerations. So, it is pretty general right now. One question though is why is it insufficient? One question for our you know for our meeting later. Maybe. Why is this yeah. insufficient? Yeah, I think it's a good place to start. It really doesn't meet the. The, the legal answer is if somebody really wanted to press us on JAM Golf, we would probably lose, which is a court big. decision on vagueness, yeah. Yeah, regulations can be void for vagueness. But it's yeah. pretty rare that that rises to the level of being void for vagueness. Well, this, one's, this one is pretty much asking for it to say that the DRC shall consider the location and appearance of utilities. How is a applicant going to know whether or yeah. not, you know, I mean, there's just, just nothing there to sink your teeth into. Um, I mean, there might be some of these that we can, you know, in, in a one through seven, we might be able to find two of them that we could sufficiently feel comfortable with, but there really should be more meat on the bones to go through and say, that's a good standard. Um, so usually if you've got a performance standard, you'll have a guideline or an entire book of design guidelines, but that's usually what you hope for with these, so you don't get thrown out in court. They exist because nobody's challenged them. For the most part, the DRC really doesn't deny applications. They do a lot of working with people to help them make their projects better, and most people come back appreciative of the process. So One of the big complaints we had um, was explained, uh, well, the, the, the DRC, or Their argument explaining the complaints they heard was that a lot of these applicants came in having already bought materials and when the DRC said they couldn't use those particular materials or windows, then that's when the conversation went a little off the rails. So when people come to them early and work through like problem solve with them, it tends to be a more successful collaboration, but when people come in with you know an idea, this is what it is. I fund, I have funding for it. This is what I'm going to do. Um, it, it hasn't worked as well. 
Or they've already done it. It's or they've already done it, yeah. So that's the background that led us to where we are. And I'm interested to see how, what we're going to see from them. We can probably expect at least one member of the public to come. Yes, we'd we've probably had, expect that one. We've had one member of the public who has been tracking this very closely. and. Um, as long as they stay out, that's all he cares. No. Well, I'm sure he has other interests because his neighborhood is currently not regulated. But yes. Anyway, so we'll see. That'll be in June sometime. Um, <coughs> okay, anything else about... Did we want to set that date so we can... I think we should wait till, I mean, do we need to tonight for, because it seems like Meredith is getting email replies. Are you on that, that chain? Yeah, there's a lot of, of it kind of going back and forth, but so. Is she is waiting for can, to warn a hearing? Or? No, it's just to warn the joint meeting. Um, so we just wanted to make sure everyone was. Meredith sent an email out to all the committee members on the DRC and then for his HPC and included Mike and me on it and asked people what dates they could come. And tonight's so, meeting was possibility and then you know, clearly we didn't, that wasn't gonna work. So <coughs> what I saw was most people can make either meeting. One person prefers the 24th, but I didn't know if she's waiting for us to give the green light or. Yeah, so I guess if you're okay here. with either, I'll leave it up to Meredith to set the, the date for the joint meeting then and we'll is there a date when is, is anyone anticipating not being around on I won't be here on the time okay so let's do the 24th I combine with the one member's preference no okay. we don't make plans because it's we're... too late we just did <laughs> is everyone okay with that <clears throat> okay that's yeah, good June 24th right that's historic. It is. Fifteen twenty four. To bring poutine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's compatible. We would not turn that down. It doesn't overwhelm the facade. Okay. <laughs> 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 Moving on. Item seven. City plan. So we're gonna can this you know. I don't know if I wrote this or Mike wrote this because it's been a few weeks, but um, we had been looking at a map and dropping pins left and right with ideas about things that we want to do in the city. Um, and then we decided we should probably take a step back and revisit the goals that the committees provided us at their all committee, the all committee kickoff meeting that we hosted. Um, so I don't know if people had a chance to revisit those. I did print out a copy. I tried to print out copies, but I was unsuccessful. So I can walk us through what I have as a reminder. Um, anyone else who has computers with them, I think you can access Is it. Is it one of the attachments? On the it's in the Google Drive. Ooh. And it was pretty easy to find, actually. What? I can't remember still. where I found it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I printed it out. I can't say that I reviewed it. That's 100%. Well, we're, we're going to go through it together right <laughs> yeah. now. Um, so we'll give Stephanie a second to pull it up. Oh, go ahead. Just, I'll see if I can find out what we're talking about. Okay. So, let's move this out of the way. It's confusing. So, MIAC, Barb is on MIAC. Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, so, I, I mean, my review of this is that they really have one goal, which is that the city should go 100% renewable. Is that fair to say? Well, net zero. Net zero energy, yes. So, you can translate that as 100% renewable. Okay, what is the difference? Um, well, it says 100% renewable. 
in the scribe that you wrote. Yeah, now, well, it, I was <laughs> writing what they said. Yes, okay, all right. We'll take their words. All right, 100% renewable. And was there a date? There are a couple dates offered. So by 2030, 100% of municipal energy use will be renewable, and by 2050, 100% of community energy use. Right, right. So can you just describe the difference? Well, recognizing that we have control, more control over municipal energy use. Mm -hmm. And we're already well on the way with municipal. We've got quite a bit of the electrical use being um, offset by <coughs> our two 500 kW um, solar arrays. And uh, a lot of work going on with uh, uh, work on the individual buildings with energy audits and energy and improvements and the work with the wastewater treatment facility which actually has a different name um wastewater recovery recovery facility okay or the water recovery whatever <laughs> we know what it is it's a sewer uh, plant yeah <laughs> and so um trying to look at, at different options the the biggest uh, stumbling block i would say right now for that the committee is looking at is transportation and trying to see how we can address transportation um, in terms of city um, vehicles and also, I mean, the city has trucks and heavy equipment, that kind of thing. So how would we know if we meet our goal of, let's say, 100% renewable municipal energy use? Well, I mean, what does this mean? How it we would mean that we're no longer um, expending money for fossil fuels. So no propane is being bought, no gasoline, no diesel. Um, that all of that has been replaced by biodiesel or some other um, fuel. And by we expending money? The city. The city. Yeah, so the budget okay. would no longer have so, okay. fossil fuel. Yeah, that's good to have sort of a, a benchmark no city money on fossil fuels. Okay. Right? Yeah. I kind of like my gas stove. But I know. I, I know. 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 That's the hardest part. It's like my husband will never <laughs> give it up ever. <laughs> no. Um, so it's we just have an asterisk in the plant community <laughs> for everything. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> stove. <laughs> 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 you sequester it something? I really no. liked 95%, <laughs> but they, you know, they decided to just dive in for a <laughs> So, <laughs> so obviously by 2050 we have uh, a much bigger step to take in terms of getting um, the whole city wide. Um, it's, but the state also has a 2050 goal as well. Uh, this is more stringent than that, but not a whole lot. So we are trying to. Yeah. So w when you say community energy, is how how is the committee defining that? Again, that would be um, that the electricity was offset. So, you know, we have net metering. So at some point, yes, we're going to be drawing electricity from Green Mountain Power, but that we are ultimately putting back at the equal amount um, into the grid. Well, they're That's, trying to go renewable anyway, right? Yeah, Just right, that. right, which actually helps us a lot. Um, and then the other thing is, is heating fuels and replacing heating fuels with alternative biofuels or replacing them with, where possible, with uh, heat pumps and other electrical. Why are biofuels acceptable as far as, because the carbon emissions is the concern here, right? Uh, actually, the fossil fuel consumption is the first one, but basically, uh, yeah, the biofuels, um, as I understand it, I mean, I've seen some demonstrations. First of all, they're generated renewably yeah. and when they're um, when they're burned um, they are not the f uh, fumes being given off that are toxic but the primary issue is is it, to my mind anyway is source um, but yeah so biofuels are a much more viable possibility than we thought originally um, yeah the corn as it grows it takes the carbon out of the air, 
makes it into the, the corn, which we crush into ethanol, which we burn, which releases CO2, which goes back into the next growing plant that grows in. So it's neutral? It's neutral. neutral. Really right, is. exactly. It's oh. neutral. Yeah. yeah. So You're just using <laughs> farmland that could be used to produce food. You're not using it to produce, which it, it has impacts in the food costs because of that. So it's just one of those considerations that other people... But, are looking at. But ethanol is not the only biofuel. Ethanol is not the only at. one, but that's the, yeah. the big one. Yeah, yeah, so what are the biofuels? The ones for, for vehicles. Maybe we're getting too down a rabbit hole here. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> we're going to get way down there. Um, okay. So waste, waste oils, basically. Okay. Big Bear biodiesel. Exactly. Black Bear biodiesel. Black Bear, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So that's the top goal. I mean, that's what's written here. I that's know. right. That okay. is the top goal. Okay. Moving and it, on. And it's, yeah, and it'll have impacts across a, a wide range of everything from the transportation plan to the housing plan to the utilities facilities plan. It's yeah. Each, has, each one of these will reach out to a number of other ones, and that's just one that, yeah. has, that touches a lot of other plans. I'm just curious, has MIAC and the Transportation Committee interacted much on this? Um, <clears throat> well, I can't say exactly because I've been gone, so I haven't been at MIAC meetings. I know that right now there's a big focus on the municipal side, looking at, at municipal consumption. And, um, so I can't say that there was, a, as far as I know, a general uh, outreach to the Transportation Committee. But I think that really needs to... But do our buses count under the municipal goal? What do you mean, our buses? Like the Montpelier circulator? Or oh, the circulator bus, yes. Because I think that's funded through a city budget. <coughs> Partially? Yeah, and there's going to be considerations that have to go into reducing. Obviously, if your goal is to be 100% renewable, then you've got to eventually replace that bus with 100% renewable fuel source. I mean, but there are sometimes you take things as as a step in the right direction. If yeah. the busing is yeah, mean twenty seven cars are off the road, then we've reduced that the amount of carbon that's being produced. Okay. And we're looking at other transportation options. So <clears throat> not necessarily, you know, continuing with the same transportation options that we have now and trying to replace their fuels. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious whether any of that work has already been done or whether this is a great opportunity to bring the committees together and work through some of these challenges. Well, um, I can tell you more after Thursday. Okay. The next MEAC meetings. All right. We'll just okay. we'll put a pin That's in good. that and, and, and just make a note. But I can also tell you that the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition is working on transportation options that would impact that as well. Well, let's go to their goals then. Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. So they gave, there's four points here. The first is not labeled, I mean, there's three goals, but before the goals, they, there's notes that say reimagine and foster stakeholder community city engagement. So I guess that's just sort of sort of their charge. Purpose. Yeah. And then their goals are um, increase access to rivers and open space with a 2030 deadline attached for results. Um, second is to have 1,000 new housing units, and third is free downtown from vehicles. Free downtown access from vehicles. No more vehicles downtown is what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. free the downtown. Yeah, yeah. Downtown. Downtown. yeah sorry. <laughs> By the vehicle yes, oppressors. Yes, that's right. That's okay. Way for me. Yes. Um, and with the idea that using satellite lots could be a way to do that. So is that what you're getting at? Like, yes. Okay. Yeah. And the discussion about you know reduction, eventual elimination of single occupancy vehicles. So that's where the transportation piece comes in. That they are moving forward <coughs> along with the Department of Transportation and other stakeholders on putting together a transfer alternative transportation plan. So all of those goals, by the way, are 2030 because that's when the coalition technically wants to be done with their work. So it's a little bit more ambitious than the 2050 goal. Okay. Were they created for the for limited 
time? Is there a sunset? They're date? A private. Oh, yeah. okay. They're grant funded, so. Okay. Yeah, not connected with the city. Okay. So right now, what they're working on is the transportation piece and the open space piece, and they've been involved with um, as um, with the uh, confluence. Parks right, and some of the members are on that committee, the proposal review committee for the downtown master plan, right? That was, yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth Courtney, who's a mm -hmm. consultant to SMC, mm -hmm. um, was involved with that. Okay. So, going back to the order that these are presented in, I just kind of want to quickly go through them. Sorry, I got in the weeds. That was my fault, everybody. Yeah. Pull mm -hmm. myself out. Um, we'll quickly go through them and then talk about kind of a visioning statement. That was the idea. Um, just throw around some ideas. So, Conservation Commission's three goals are stormwater management plan, uh, to inventory the natural resources in order to better protect them, and to teach to do some public education about where the resources are. So I see those two as actually kind of tied, but um, one comes before the other, perhaps. For the first one, were, did they have a goal of changing our system so that our, so that our stormwater system does not pollute at all? I mean, is that the goal? I think they're involved in the development of the stormwater master plan, um, but I'm not positive. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was a lot that has been going on and certainly is a lot at the state. And I think we've just got a lot of pieces that we haven't been doing as much as we could be with stormwater. And I think we just have a lot of pieces that just have to get pulled together. Our zoning didn't get an update to the stormwater rules because the state wasn't ready with their rules. So we still have to do that. We still got to get some. Stephanie, do you have the PowerPoint? In the files there, because mm. that might go. Oh, that more was detail. I made that. So yeah, somewhere in my files I do. Because uh, it has been a while. I mean, this is the meeting was in August, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it makes sense that we wouldn't remember. I do have the slides. That's okay. And there are state and national, federal rules that we need to meet for stormwater as well. Is that right? Yeah, no, yeah. Name. There's this. There's the EPA. It's a TMDL requirement for Lake Champlain, which we're part of. So there are. Um, that filters down through the state. It rules. works its way down to, mm -hmm. to us. So yeah, yeah. It's requirements as well as goals. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we've got floodplain and river corridors, and so there are a lot of pieces that, though not directly stormwater, are kind of related to water quality. They didn't send us notes ahead of time, so I just have the placeholder with it. Oh, um, okay. All right. Well, I have an in with them. I could ask. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's gonna that's a a big issue for the city to contend with. So I think it's what we're gonna be. Be part of the on. downtown master plan SC group effort, right? Yeah, that'll certainly have a big impact. And then as far as their mapping, I mean, they're working on, are they working on the city map? The, what's it called? The official map? No. The, the official map, map was, was kind of put to bed because that's not what the park, Parks Commission want. The inventory there is kind of, I think, more of a classic, um, just getting <coughs> all of the, inventorying all the data. So no regulatory Putting it onto maps. It, well, it could. If we've got better data and it, points to something that we should be looking at from a regulatory standpoint. I mean, we've kind of jumped in with steep slopes and wetlands and vernal pools, but if there's something else that's in there that we should be considering in our zoning, um, I'm a big fan of regulating to the map. So if they are mapping resources and finding things that need to be protected, Act 250 looks at um, prime ag soils. Um, you know, I don't think we should be looking at them because we're kind of a city and we want people to be building here so they're not building in the country. But 
obviously any of these natural resources that get mapped could be used as a regulatory basis. And by the way, the vernal pool in Hubbard Park near the new shelter, the wood frogs laid their eggs there. You can go see them right now. Pretty cool. There's a fence around it to keep the dogs out. <laughs> but no buffer. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the is that the the pond at the bottom of the hill that no, okay. Oh, okay, out. good. I was gonna say the one at the bottom was supposed to be cleaned out. This Your year. dog hasn't gone in there, right? What? No. <laughs> He's <laughs> upstanding citizen. <laughs> he actually hasn't gone in this year. So. <laughs> okay, Fresh so. Yeah. Um, Montpelier Development Court. Their goals. The main, I guess, is like three ways to achieve this goal. The goal, Montpelier is a cultural, economic, social center. Number one, wrap around for new and existing businesses. I don't know what that means. Kind of made sense when she said it, though. Yep. <laughs> Number two, destination for arts and culture. Number three, transform. Community values and amenities are realized, meaning the river, et cetera. So wrap around for new and existing. I mean, is that things. like technical assistance or support or some, I some think way? So, yeah. yeah. Existing businesses. I'll make a note. An embrace. <laughs> an embrace <laughs> for <laughs> new and existing businesses. Yeah. I think it's services. Okay. Okay. It doesn't have like a hug emoji. <laughs> okay. Okay. Housing authority. So I just want to know there's a housing authority and a housing task. <coughs> I just wanna, the housing authority goals are to promote cooperation and communication with agencies. And I guess they mean which agencies? Well, they're Washington County Mental Health, uh, okay. a couple other ones. I mean, so the housing authority is kind of the housing of last resort that the city has. So they administer the okay. Section 8 vouchers, and they have housing in a number of locations, which is different than, say, Down Street, who has affordable housing. Okay. okay. And so their coordination, they're usually coordinating with Social Security and Medicaid and Washington County Mental Health and you know these folks that are you know the police and fire when they you know um, hopefully domestic it's not violence. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just a, oh, hopefully you, it's not the housing know. of last resort, but housing for people in, you know, straightened economic circumstances. Yes. Thank you Hopefully for it's that. not the last yeah. resort. Thank you for that. Yes. It should be quality. Right. Do they have any goals? I mean, do they want to see more housing developed um, for their clients? My memory of their presentation was they basically want to maintain what they have, which As federally, they're not is, gonna, is their thing. They're not gonna get more yeah, I mean, housing authorities, some other housing housing authorities do want to develop, but this housing authority has a, maybe a different okay. outlook. Okay. Um, I'll just keep plugging through. So, transportation committee. Um, it's funny because they're, I guess their three goals are implement the existing plans safe and inviting uh, atmosphere for pedestrian and bikes and accommodate and encourage transit. <laughs> so the existing plans are the Montpelier in Motion Complete Streets and Mont Main Street Scoping Study. Uh, is the Main Street Scoping Study the downtown Very main master study, yeah. Oh, it's the, okay, it's different from the downtown master yeah. plan. The thing is going to be based on the, Sorry. The, the public works. Very main. No, I actually, it's just. It's, it's hard to like keep these all straight mm -hmm. and how they interrelate and how they interact. So. Yes, they yeah. they were each slightly slightly different. Um, we probably should have done them in a different order, but we we got there anyways. So the 
street, the complete streets looked at a street typology, what would you expect each one of the streets to have as their compo components? The Montpelier in motion was really a gap analysis. Where are we missing our sidewalks? Where are we missing our bike lanes? We've got a sidewalk here that leads to nowhere. Then over there is the next sidewalk. We need to complete the sidewalk here. So that plan was really laying out a gap analysis of what we should be working on and where we should be prioritizing our fixes. But sidewalk focus. But, so well, sidewalk bike lanes, but mostly mm -hmm. a lot of it is sidewalks. So, so the relationship between the Transportation Committee and the city is pretty tight, I would hope, that things they identify or, or what the city is are prioritizing? Yeah, we're trying. The, the main point of those is to provide the evidence and information we need to develop the capital improvement plan so that $600,000 we get every year to build new projects, retaining walls and sidewalks, repaving, painting, whatever it is that we've got this chunk of funds. And so they've got a 10-year plan, and they lay out for 10 years what are all the projects we're going to be working on. Well, what comes out of these plans helps to push some things up to the front to get them done sooner, you know, scoring them a little bit better, moving them up in the capital improvement plan, um, or putting new things on the capital improvement plan that we didn't didn't know about. So that's that's where the strongest link comes in for the transportation committee is they they fund a lot of their stuff through the next project in the line. And that's the same as the infrastructure committee, transportation infrastructure. Yeah, that's basically the transportation infrastructure committee because the other one that's the complete streets committee is really just more events. Okay. All right. Good. Public Safety Authority. This is more about like dispatch services, right? It's dispatch services. It's pretty much toast at this point, as far as I know. We didn't. I don't think we funded them. I don't think they have any more money. Yeah, I don't think they did anything. We finally pulled pulled the plug on their funding, so I think they may technically exist because they're a chartered entity, but I don't know where they're going to go. Staff. So the they goal. might have staff through June 30th because their funding would end on July 1st. But, but the goal was to look at a multi-city dispatch. Yep. Right? And that seems to have kind of fallen apart. Yep. I think that's a question we'd have to ask Kim, Ch Kim Cheney. He was, he was on the committee. Mm -hmm. So are we resorting to state dispatch? No, we still have our dispatch, and Barry City has their dispatch, but the thought was we could merge these two into a single dispatching service. This committee was looking at that. This could we, and there are a lot of sideshows that go along with it. And if we didn't have it, then we would just have our the state dispatch, right? Yes. But the thought was this is, <coughs> this this does actually function for 27. Like we we provide service for a number of communities through contracts so um, if we stop doing it it would require major expansion of the state e911 system which may not always be good if you don't have um, the local knowledge so any e911 call here <coughs> in the city you're gonna get somebody in town that knows Montpelier as opposed to getting an e911 call that's being dispatched through Wellston with somebody who may never have been a Montpelier. So. Is there any data that supports that? It's an argument people throw out along, and I always wondered, like, one, it doesn't, you don't have guaranteed local knowledge for someone who works somewhere, and two, wouldn't a really good experienced dispatcher potentially offset some local knowledge? A state, a statewide experience dispatcher. I, I'm not yeah. suggesting one or the other. I'm just saying I've never seen any kind of data that supports one argument or another. But maybe let's yeah. not bet go into these weeds <laughs> and bet this morning's <laughs> nest because yeah, yeah I think we would have to invite them. Small, which yeah. makes it less likely for something to get lost. Yeah, I think we would have yeah. to invite folks to to so come in and pitch both sides and, and, and how many. How many other um, areas 
does our dispatch work for Berlin and uh, other surrounding? It's really a mix. It's really a mix. I think they've got 20 something towns that we do, that we and do. Barry has a handful that they do. Berlin, I think, is serviced by the state police. And. Hi, Emory. Thanks for coming. There are some others that are that are different as well. So the. Um, and I know there was some discussion of the way things work right now. You know, if, if somebody called. If it got dispatched to fire, then it's going through one service. Just if, if it was dispatched to police, it's going through another service. And so in, in a situation which may have multiple dispatching things going on, you're going to have two separate sets of communications going that aren't connected. But like I said, I've, I, this is not something I'm first at. I've, just, I've sat in a couple of council meetings while they've had some debates on these. You could go to those, John. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like the return on investment for us uh, uh -uh. messing around in there might be pretty low for this, <laughs> given uh, if this thing fell apart. <laughs> well, let's move yeah. on to the housing task force on that note. <laughs> so this is the group that, that wants to expand housing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These are your big heavy hitters of housing. Okay, so their goals are to have adequate rental and owner-occupied homes with diverse and then something kind of fell off there. But I guess I'm assuming it's diverse types of homes yeah. for different needs, to fulfill different needs. Um, they want to have safe, healthy, energy efficient, resilient, accessible, mix of uses and open space. So I guess it's access to those sort of uses from these, from these homes. And then housing for all, fair housing and inclusive community. Um, thoughts? Questions? I think I feel like that needs to be flushed out a lot. Because I mean we, we know it's a major need and, and to have some actual like goals. Like we have the sustainable molecular coalition asking for a thousand new yeah. units. That that doesn't have a timeline on it, but Flushing 2030. Out. It is. Okay. Well, the, we've talked about how the Sustainable Montpelier Co Coalition wants to have it worked on in 2030. Okay. So do you think that means 2030? Well, we can assume right. that. That was based on the competition, which was the 2030 goal. Okay. So that was a thousand new units. So that's where that came from. Yeah, the adopted numbers for the housing task force are 150 housing units in five years and 240 in eight. Okay, 150 in five years. And 240 over the eight years. What are we currently doing? Like, what did we? How many units did we have last year? Mm. This the last year was was not bad, depending on when you're counting the year, because we had 18 um, for French Block and six more for. Um, so yeah, French Block, for instance, was a pretty big project, that, but that just amounted to 18 units. Yep. Yep, and then there were six more in the Maple, which is the end of Charles Street there, a little extension. Um, and then there were a handful of ones and twos around here and there. We'll we'll get a better number in the next couple of couple of weeks. We'll get some better numbers of how many. But okay. usually we're talking ten units a year if we're lucky. And how many are we adding on Taylor Street? The big projects are making big difference. Taylor will be thirty. 30. Um, and then, yeah, and then there's another 30 proposed for the Christ Church, which is if the parking garage gets built, then Christ Church would be another 30. We have a long way to go to get to 1,000. Yeah, it's a long way to go to get to 1,000. Um, the, big, the big ones kind of come in if you can get a big project. You know, the potential is, you know, 225 units for Saban's Pasture. I mean, it could be more than that, but the... Trust for Public Lands was talking about 200, 225 units. So um, the the Team Bridges proposal was talking hundreds, but that requires a much bigger lift. If you want to reach the thousand, then you have to talk about making that rail line and making it for um, that trolley bus shuttle system where we could put 
a couple hundred units on Pioneer Street and then a couple hundred more units as you're going out, you know, to, to help people, give people options where they could live without a car and just take these shuttles into the downtown to go to work or shuttle out to um, Price Chopper and those places to go shopping. You know, you can get some movement moving around and then having some micro transit or other opportunities to kind of take those other other places. But that's that's the bigger, if, if you want to get that thousand, that's what you're talking about, is mm -hmm. having to do some big mm -hmm. at transformational projects. Right, mm -hmm. at neighborhoods, not just individual buildings. Yeah, you're building, the, yeah, you're building neighborhoods to make a thousand. And I didn't realize it was that hard. I was really surprised to see how yeah. how hard it was. You know, you I see a big too. building and you think, oh, that must be a lot of units. And you find out, oh, that's, you know, French block was 18. And mm -hmm. I mean, there is some movement too. And so I think some of the bridges included this is that micro units. So potentially in a fairly large building, you could have a lot more units than what you would normally think. That we could have micro units yep. that were half the size of the units in, in the um, French block. Yeah, and the a ADU program that's being proposed, the accessory dwelling units yeah. will is another one where we've got five hundred thousand dollars, and it looks really likely that we're going to be able to just help people add units to existing houses. So it's going to be right building right into infill into the neighborhoods, and there's a lot of people who are interested in putting an apartment over a garage, putting an apartment in their house, subdividing a second floor, whatever. So what's the, is that new money, the ADU program? That is a community development block grant with funding from the city and with funding from the people who are doing it, which is, I'll probably get the wrong one, VCFA? One of these housing, one of the housing ones. VCHB? Yeah. Vermont Conservation Housing Board? Yeah, it's VHCB. VHCB. Wait, what is it? VHCB. VHCB. No, it's not VHCB. I don't think it was yours. Yeah, it's, it's the finance. There's a finance, a housing finance. Oh, oh VHFA. VHFA. Oh, yeah. oh okay. I didn't there know we they were doing it. Yeah, so they've got, they did a pilot in Brattleboro. What does VHFA stand for? Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Okay. Welcome to another episode of World of Background. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, well, which I'm is why I prefaced right my right statement, and I'm going to get the letters wrong because I can't remember which one it is. Wash over me. But <laughs> the, the idea is they, they were going to put in 150000 The thought was you look at these large projects, um, whether it's Downstreet or um, Vermont Housing, and they, they cost $250,000 a unit, $230,000, $250,000 a unit to build or renovate a major unit. And the ask here was for $300,000, so we could do 30 units. So we're going to try to get a lot more units for the same amount, because the state's looking at their budgets and saying, boy, if we need statewide X number of thousand units, we, I mean, that's millions upon millions. We're, we, I mean, we're just going to keep bonding ourselves out. So we need to find a, a more cost-effective way to add more units this ADU program is a match money. So Kirby wants to put in an ADU and goes and says, hey, if I had that, I could make an extra thousand bucks. That helps me, because I could rent this unit out for 800 or a thousand bucks a month, and I'm doing, I'm doing better affording my house. Plus, I'm making another affordable housing unit for somebody else. It's gonna cost me $40,000 to do this, to put in this new unit. Well, if you can, do uh, you know get a line of credit or do something like that borrow some money we'll match that money up to ten or twenty thousand dollars we can give a zero percent loan we can you know they, they they bundle up a bunch of money to then try to help people do it and they put the proposal out and we got you know more than 20 people who are interested oh, in, did you have people signed up well because we want it to be a one we went to the state for our application, we wanted to be able to make sure we were on the front of the line because there's more projects and there are money. So we wanted to make sure that this pilot program would be up front. And so by putting it out and saying, hey, who's interested, we could put into the application that says, look, you give us the money, this year we could start working on these. So 
you should fund us before you fund those guys who have a great idea, but they're not ready to go yet. We're ready to go. So that was our thought. So we had a lot of people who are interested in doing these, and so we're hoping we'll get funded and we'll be able to start working on those this year. But that would be, you know, 10, 20 units, one at a time. But And you're up to 10,000 you'd have to the specifics Something yeah like the specifics that. you'd have to talk, contact when, when Kevin find out if we've gotten that yeah I remember when the next I'm, I'm actually thinking maybe this is a proposal to us and we just haven't reviewed it yet so I can I can find okay. out okay, okay. Right. I, I think <laughs> yeah. or talk with talk with Kevin that. yeah yeah it's, yeah because yeah, yeah, they're funding from a number of people we're we've got money they've got money community development block grant has money it's going to be kind of a thing where everybody throws throws some money in um, to try to make it happen but I think it's a it's it's another way of getting one of those when we start talking about how do we get 150 units there's gonna be some of these that are gonna be big chunks they're going to be some of these are going to be small trunks here. Some of these are just going to be one at a time. Does, um, I don't know if we've talked about plans for MPG application, but it'd be interesting to see if it could be complementary, um, maybe MPG. to this, uh, sorry, municipal planning grant, um, which we apply for, I think most years. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing specifically that could be interested, interesting is there's a group called the Incremental Development Alliance led by someone named John Anderson, but not our John Anderson. So the, the flyers for this would have to, could be confusing. Mm -hmm. This was an event. They come and they do a developer's boot camp, and they, they sort of focus on small towns across the country. And the message is mostly like, you know, all of these groups are trying to encourage housing development downtown, and you have a lot of well-meaning people coming up with regulations for like these developers that don't exist are going to come from somewhere to build something and the reality is it's just not going to happen and that if anyone's going to build something it's going to be you and that's how American small towns grew forever it was people building things small you know, four unit six unit buildings and that's it's not that hard they basically would break down like the first one was sort of I think they have a three day thing but also provides a, a bit of a community on how, how you can become a developer. Mm -hmm. um, I think something like that could be. What's the company called again? It's a nonprofit, I think, called the um, Incremental Development Alliance. And John Anderson is, I think, their main speaker. He's great. He's very crass, but it's, mm -hmm. it works well. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's funny and great as long as people are okay with you. <laughs> <laughs> Colorful language. So for the of it, for the next person, the church, and the I don't know what that means, <laughs> but. Know. Well, how does it speak at all speak to you? It won't be the most of the time. Don't worry, you're going to be So, um, your thought is that we can integrate that through the school planning grant? Yeah, find some funding source. I don't, I don't know how much it is to have them come do a workshop, but um, so my so when is the municipal planning grant deadline? They're in the in the fall. Okay. But if we have specific things that we think we want to start exploring, we can certainly pull them together. Because one of the new things that they let us do now is to put put projects out to bid. Early. So if we know what we'd like to do in the fall, we can put out an RFP in in June or July to solicit bids for what we want to do, and then you then you're actually applying for the money to do the project, and it gets better points, and it's something new that they're doing, and I kind of I kind of like it. It makes it you know how much you're going to spend because you've already bid it out, and they've already told you we can do this project for. Fifteen thousand dollars, so you can put it in and say we've already bid it. It's fifteen thousand dollars, and then you're ready to go. Instead of getting the funding, doing your RFP, and then finding out, oh, we we got a grant for eighteen thousand dollars to do a project that's costing us twenty-one. Now, what do we do? So, are people interested in pursuing grant money to put on a workshop, develop a boot camp workshop? 
related to housing? Yeah, like I said, we, I can look and see what we what we know and how much it these are and whether something that would be competitive. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Sounds like John is. Sounds like yeah, John yeah. is. The source of information. It's, it's, um, it's a lot of the most of the folks are seeing um, people. Uh, uh, Congress and your group are involved. The housing task force. Mm -hmm. And I think um, ARP and BNRC brought them in to give a talk, brought him in to give a talk on some smart growth event. Hmm. I'll look, I'll look into it to see what the costs or so pieces are. Potential partners. Uh, the development. So Laura left, I mean, left, right? So development corp. Development corp. What was the other one you named besides the, the house? The regional planning commission. Okay. Although I mean, part of our goal is to have development in urban areas, not the entire region. But mm -hmm. They do have funding for things, though. So. Okay. Good idea. All right, next. I, I think it's helpful for us to go through these goals. Yeah. I know it seems a little bit Definitely. tedious, but I think no, it's okay. really triggering <coughs> some ideas. So, Parks Commission, their list, the bullets say this green print parks and trail access to all residents, enhance outdoor recreation facilities for all abilities and types of activity. Protect, preserve natural areas, eradicate invasives, and parks advocation for improvement. Um, green print, that's the map, the trail map, right? That's trails and parks. Uh, so it's kind of a mix planned of a map. Planned trails and parks? That's the thing. It's planned, and what they were hoping for, and this was part of the confusion of the official map, was they wanted to get the green print map an idea adopted officially but what they didn't realize was that all they had to do is go to city council and give a presentation and council would adopt it and it would be adopted yeah and so in the end we was like well if that's all you want then just go to city council and get it adopted so that's what they're going to be doing okay so it, and the implications for an official map like that is that the city has first right of refusal if, yeah, it starts to, f it forces a process, which was counter to actually what the green print said, which was in it, the green print kind of expressly says, this this is all about willing buyer, willing seller, we're not here to force this upon you. And then when we're talking about the official map, we're talking about basically forcing us, forcing you to give us an option on the property when you go to develop the land. And so it was one they really weren't comfortable with, and in the end, I think it worked out worked out well because what they want to do is to have it adopted the green print so they can start to pursue grant funding to try to purchase land because there's properties come up where they can actually reach out to people to go through and say we'd love to put a trail across your property you know we've got some grant funding you know um, they just wanted to have more of an opportunity but they couldn't apply for grants because the plan had never been adopted so we don't have to worry about the official map anymore? You don't that's have to worry hearing? about the official map anymore. Okay, well Unless somebody else comes up with some other reason why we would want to pursue it. But so we don't have to have one, no. is what you're saying? Okay. No, there are only a handful of towns that do. Oh, I thought it was a requirement. No, I no. mean, we have to have our land use map mm -hmm. as part of our city plan. But the official map piece, that is so background for you everybody. This. <laughs> background yeah. alert. It's There's really confusing. <laughs> um, so when we were working through the zoning on, I can't remember what the exact issue was here, but I think there was some question about whether the natural resources maps, which would trigger some restrictions on development around wetlands, whether there would be the integration of the green print trail, trail map as part of that process. 
and uh, we determined as a commission that the official map was a better way to go about that than through the zoning and explain that to the Parks Commission. And so as far as, you know, setting goals for where parks should be or where trails should be and working through the process with landowners through zoning, we kicked it to the official map development, um, which apparently they're now pursuing without our aid, which is yeah, great. The, yeah, the other piece that came up in the zoning and how this all came out was from there's a tendency f for people to go and start, you know, somebody comes up and develop, let's say, Saban's pasture, <coughs> and people start to go and say, oh, but you should, you know, we should, we should, if you're going to make that open space on top, you should make it open to the public. And you can't use zoning, the case that the Supreme Court has recently just kept pushing towards a certain pretty clear point, which is that you can't use regulations to deny somebody their constitutional rights and if you're going to open something up to public use you have to pay just compensation so you can't use zoning to create a bike path across somebody's property or you know provide public access you know and so we eventually came across to go through and say if you want to require public access you can't use zoning you'd have to use an official map and we would have to buy it um, and so there were a number of cases where people came up and pushed and wanted to get that option to be able to buy those rights. And so that was where that, and it eventually kind of fell off because the parks really wasn't interested in kind of forcing that. They would rather try to negotiate for the right to cross somebody's land. Um, so, so it seems like the green <coughs> print and then the next bullet, parks and trail access to all residents is kind of tied together or the green print is one method of making this goal come to fruition. Yes. Enhance outdoor recreation facilities for all abilities and types of activity. Protect, preserve natural resource, natural areas. So I guess that would be um, tied to conservation commission goals. Yeah, the Parks Commission owns the land. So in a number of cases, whether we're talking about buying a piece of land to protect it from development because it's a rare natural species habitat. The Conservation Commission doesn't, they may want it, but it's not gonna, they, they can't own the land. So there's, a, the Parks Commission ends up kind of doing the recreation fields that are at the rec down the road um, on, on Elm Street. And they also have the places where we're just conserving land for conservation purposes. Mm -hmm. So they do preservation and conservation. Okay. In terms of how it might impact the city planning, <coughs> was one of their thoughts that they wanted every house, every dwelling unit to have access to parks within a certain distance. Yeah, a 10 minute walk or something. Yeah, right, so that becomes a, a more of a planning issue for us then, yeah, to really look at those little pocket mm -hmm. parks. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily big parks. Do you say we're running out of time? Yeah, we're running out of time. I'm just realizing we, we only have eight minutes left, and we're not going to get through all these goals that come up with our visioning statement. Um, who was it who came up with the idea for the envisioning, the visioning statement? Was that? I really don't want to be you, Stephanie. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can give us some more guidance on what you're thinking of, or and then we can come back with ideas. My, my thought was just that we we, had, we spent the energy getting all of these thoughts, so that was one piece, but mm -hmm. then also that we're talking about the the plan and in these separate sections by committee. Mm -hmm. so, so to some degree, it's we're sort of talking about it like we're outsourcing that work, and it, for me it would be helpful that this committee have some sort of overall yeah. vision that we're putting out to those committees so that they're not just each doing their own separate thing. Right. Yeah, I agree. So, I was just going to say, and then we, ha we have the template um, that I did up for the energy committee based on what Barb had given me, which provides the visioning statement. There's three parts, visioning statement, then measurable sort of objectives, and then implementation uh, uh, policies and actions. So those visioning statements for each um, committee or each 
Right, but, right. but not an overall vision. They just like well, that's a cohesive together. Yeah, and it seems like that's what we should be doing, yeah. is looking yeah. all of the all of these and just, I don't know, in looking reading through all of them, it does seem like there is sort of a theme emerging that ties all of them together. It feels like a lot of it is around sort of housing and walkability in downtown and making uh Montpelier a place for human beings uh, to live in. Uh, Making Montpelier a place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It might be a tough vision. Well, welcome to Montpelier. A place for you. <laughs> a place for humans. A place for people. I, you know, I, no wait till all species, wait till all species <laughs> goes after you. This is a great starting point. Yeah, you just need some ideas to work with and you know, start molding. I mean, so pedestrian or walkability. Walk mm -hmm. Sustainability seems to be coming up. Mm -hmm. Energy and other things. Sustainability. Density. No, don't use that mm -hmm. word. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, um, not, not the yeah, replacing um, parking lots, basically. Mm -hmm. Creating more cohesive. Cohesive. Um, Transport options. Housing options. I don't know. Yeah, something like our yeah, utilizing our vacant spaces downtown more fully. Yeah. And also utilizing us uh, when we said that utilizing our natural um, amenities. The amenities right. that we have, which are the river and the That comes yeah. up a lot. Yeah. The river does. comes up a lot. Yeah. And we have, we have to recognize our amenities. Highlighting them instead of like Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, we're yeah, our back to you. making them an element mm -hmm. of the city. Does anyone know if part of the green print included future parks along the river? Don't remember. Most of the parks I remember on that were more on the outsides, more of a hub and spoke approach so we had a hubbard park we've got a you know the confluence park is part of that but there's also now a group of people who are looking at i think what she's calling five bridges uh basically looking at the string of the river as it goes through the downtown and trying to develop more as parkland um, mm -hmm. Seems like that would attract development. So, what are the key amenities of the city? We heard. I, I just let's list them off. So, the river. River. Hubbard Park. Okay. Hubbard Park. Hubbard Park. Yeah. What about the historic downtown? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dairy Cream. <laughs> yeah. Historic neighborhoods. Just food in general. <laughs> Places to buy different types of food. Right, poutine. <laughs> oh my God. Um, like state capital. I mean, being the capital is really. We don't go there anymore. I'm right? not hearing oh, anything yeah. about housing. Yeah. We need to, that's something we need to change, right? I mean, amenities. We need more like. Well, the amenities we have. Our, that makes me think in terms of like public amenities. Yeah, you're right. So we're thinking like, we're thinking like, geographically. Environmental amenities right yeah. now. But also, I mean, if we're talking about our historic downtown and our historic neighborhoods as well, which those are, those are housing. Well, you could say that the historic housing stock is not a community in a, in a practical sense, that we have old housing, old housing stock, which is difficult, yeah. Except that that's what draws people here. That's okay. why a lot of people move here. So, like the historic challenges. It's, uh, Okay. No, I think that's a, that's a good point, though. The historic buildings not necessarily meeting the current needs. So, like, College Street, these gigantic houses that people, a lot of people can't afford to buy, much less heat, as one unit. So that's not, yeah. it's a beautiful historic building, but is it functional in well, in that sense for what we need right now? Yeah, yeah. It's mismatched to our well, yeah, needs exactly. and demographics. So how do we adapt yeah. to yeah. make because it Because right? they certainly could be matched very easily. Right. But without losing that cultural, historic structure. 
So maybe we're talking about maintaining historic neighborhoods. But we're just identifying challenges right. right now. Yeah. We'll get to or solutions amenities. at some point. Yeah. But I mean, amenities, and I, I heard amenities kind of morph into challenges, so I thought let's just start with challenges. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's Make it good. Uh, let's just take one more, 30 more seconds to one minute. And other challenges. Just the volume of housing stuff. Yeah. Lack of housing. transportation I don't know how you would word it but I mean we've got when you have 8,000 people come to town every day the parking is a challenge and it's yeah. just to a certain extent there is a desire to not have parking and not have cars but to a certain extent you'll have consequences that will come out for that. so the tension so between being the capital and hosting being a job center and jobs. yeah I mean, it's, it's swelling it's, the population doubling yeah, that sort of bleeds into, there's both local and regional public transit challenges. I think there were a, a partnership with the state seems to be an elephant in the room for a lot of these things. Like the state needs to help us solve the parking problem that we're down there. Yeah, just giving every employee a free parking space downtown. Would you like to be the person who tells mm -hmm. them they have to pay now? I've done it before. <laughs> Continue to do it, but uh, John doesn't care. People aren't very popular. This idea is not terribly popular. Yeah, surprise, surprise. And the state owns a decent number of lots too. It's a huge, yeah. huge percentage of it is state, state and city. All right. Well, let's pick up this well, discussion the city next time. Turn gave six hundred bucks to give up the parking pass. Yeah, and the cash out. California requires it. The, the city. That's what the city did this year to try to open up our parking spaces. They offered everybody the money to cash out and their parking pass. How did that work? Didn't get as many as they had hoped, but this is they for got, city employees. Yeah, for yeah. city employees. But I think six of us cashed it's out. A state what employee who just who walks to work. I didn't want to hear about getting some free money. <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, what, was the cash, what was the cash out value? Fifty dollars a month. So oh. yeah. they could do so it with start with like legislators, right? So then just put up meters and then they can I all park on stone cutters the money they out. get from the meters. Further. Out, yeah. out farther, but it's yeah. it's in parking that so nobody parks in. So all that right. land, so the parking lots are on and build a garage behind the task department. Something like that. All right. Well, yeah. Let's pick this up next so time. Okay. Next time. <laughs> we'll finish going through the, <laughs> the notes from the all committee <laughs> meeting. We'll um we'll see if we can get to some sort of visioning statement. Um, Broadly, and if we need to start with some of the. I think things. we figured it out. Well, no, Billy, you're a place for humans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I right. appreciate no. the seeing. Wait, 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 wait. Before everybody packs humans up and go, up. let's humans. quickly look at the meeting minutes from April 8th. Oh, place for humans and their pets. Sorry. To, okay. <laughs> Might be more political. Than really yeah. Do I have a motion to approve it. these minutes? And move approval of the minutes. Second. So, Ariane moved. Stephanie seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes, vote aye. 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 All those opposed? None. They are approved. Um, there is no meeting on May 27th, Memorial Day. Do you folks think we need to meet next time? <coughs> Based on our discussion today, I think we could wait till June 10th. Pick this up then. Um, Take your, Mike's going to drop some things in the Google Drive. So take a look at that in between now and then. Um, and we'll, we'll pick this up and we can look at the map again maybe next time. On your computer, assuming you're here. Yeah. Not, yeah. Um, the information from um, uh, the competition, did that end up on our Google Drive? It's been there for like a year. Yeah, okay. I so think it was one sure. of the first things that popped up. Everybody told yeah. Marcus yeah. to take a look at the Google yeah. Drive. I can't. That's the homework, okay. okay. All right, do you have a mo uh, motion to adjourn? adjourn? Okay, Aaron. Aaron. Second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.